clock is ticking. And there are just about 1,400 days left to reinvent and then unveil an automotive icon, the Porsche 911. To do it, they'll have to battle heat and ice and add a state-of-the-art paint shop to the original factory. It's a completely new car. A new car that's in a race the company can't afford to lose. We know if this car goes wrong, then everything goes wrong. And success or failure will be determined inside Porsche's mega factory. The decision has been made to create a completely new version of one of the most famous sports cars ever built. A machine known by just three numbers, 911. The car wasn't changed for the longest time, really. Now the company behind the car faces an extremely unusual challenge. How to update an automotive icon while staying true to its past. I knew a 911 had to look like a 911. And embracing the future. Well, this car has almost no carryover parts from its predecessor. It's an evolution that is fraught with revolutionary risks. For the machine... We have many very conservative customers. They don't like to change the 911 too much. And for the brand... Charm comes from history. But you can't change anything without people complaining about it and people getting upset about it. And time is not on the car's side. Since 2008, 911 sales have plummeted, dropping over 20% each year. Porsche needs a new 911, and they need it fast. They target the Frankfurt Auto Show in September 2011 for the new car's introduction. The clock is ticking to reinvent an icon in order to survive. But their current factory can't do the job. Both the case of the car and the factory, it's like buying a historical building and thinking you're gonna be able to do with it what you want, but you can't change anything. Both the factory and the car must respect the past while gearing up for the future. We are actually at the historic site. This is where the company started in 1949. So this is the former main entrance. When the original Porsche factory was first built, there was a lot of open land around it. But the company quickly found itself landlocked. It changed a lot, you know. It really started here on a very small site and we couldn't really expand it. We have a lot of restrictions we have a little neighbors here, all kind of small businesses. The Porsche factory is located in Zuffenhausen, Germany, a small suburb of Stuttgart. And in the late 1960s and early 70s, the town rapidly expands, literally growing up around the Porsche factory. The spreading fame of the company only makes things worse. Demand for new cars is growing. And then the city of Stuttgart honors the Porsche family by declaring the factory a historic landmark. The original brick buildings cannot be changed. 
If the factory is to grow, the company needs to find other solutions. That's part of our heritage. In this building, the old Professor Porsche was already working. You can't tear this down. We're very proud of it. The board of directors of Porsche is still working in this old building. So now, a strange dual race is on. Involving both architects and engineers. Because they can't build a new 911. Without a new paint shop. Well, our old paint shop was quite old, so we knew we have to do something and the new technology won't fit into the old paint shop, especially for the new 911. With no room to grow, fate provides an answer. No, it was not an empty spot. It was another company. We are lucky this company moved somewhere else so we could take over their property. We had to turn down all the buildings over there and then we had the space, luckily the, the right space. Demolition begins in 2006. Before the rubble is cleared, Porsche architects have a plan. We have here the paint shop. You can see it by the size. It's much bigger than our body shop and the former paint shop, which is only that tiny little building here. So it's more than double the size as it used to be. Double the size? Because Porsche needs to double their production at Zuffenhausen. We decided that we need a new paint shop. The old one had been run out and so on, and it's not possible to paint the cars in the new paint qualities which are necessary today. While demolition takes place, Porsche engineers and designers are working on the totally new 911. Their goal is to create a car that's faster than the one it will replace. And competitive with other modern sports cars. Can you imagine Apple coming out with an iPhone that's shaped like one of the brick phones from the 1980s, or even better, some one of those ring ringy dingy phones from the 1920s? I mean, Porsche is stuck in a design that's so old and timeless and gorgeous and all that, but they have to make a sports car that keeps up with other cars. But the machine still needs to be recognized as a 911. In the 60s and the 70s, when the 911 became very popular, at a certain point people have realized that this is a car that, from a technical point of view, is not like the others. The original idea behind a 911 was that it's a car that you can drive every day. It's never been about, like, hey, ladies, it's not about that. It was about somebody who knew better on how to drive. The only thing that really counts is that the engine on this car is all the way behind the back wheels. And it's not mid-engine, like the engine's not here. The engine is back here and that creates all kinds of problems dynamically. An engine that sits behind the rear wheels is unusual in the automotive world. It fights not only convention, but physics. If you can imagine running around with a shopping cart behind you full of stuff, when you go to turn, the car is gonna keep, the cart is gonna wanna go straight. And that's the same thing with the 911. The back end of the car is always moving around. movement that challenges a driver and one of the reasons the car develops such a rabid fan base we realized that the owners and the fans of this car they wouldn't really want to have something completely different a car based on evolution not revolution so really this is the link to past and future
The model the new 911 replaces has been on the market for about eight years. In the sports car world, that is an eternity. To survive, Porsche follows a German modernist design philosophy. Weniger, aber besser. Weniger, aber besser means uh, less but better. Not just the meaning of design, it applies for the whole car to sort of concentrate on just a few things and fine hone them in the long run. It gives this sort of timeless appeal. The 911 might be a timeless design, but the race to build the paint shop is not. They break ground in 2009, just two years before the new model's planned introduction. The equipment inside is very dominating. The equipment actually tells you what to do. You are not that free as in an office space. The designer is an architect. You can tell, okay, that's the way the building's supposed to look like. In this case, actually, the people who are doing the design for the equipment inside, they're going to tell you how the building's supposed to look like. They build both the inside and outside of the building virtually at the same time. Usually you build the building first and then you put in all the equipment. We didn't have the time to do it one after another, so we had to put in the equipment before the building was finished. So we built up a complete new paint shop, new paint facility, which is one of the most modern a facility all over the world with the lowest emissions, much lower than which is necessary from the legal requirements. As architects and construction crews focus on the building, engineers focus on testing new 911s all over the world. Sometimes there are ideas which we test in prototypes and get some experiences with it because we also have to answer the question, is this the right step? They drive prototypes through the burning temperatures of Death Valley in the United States. the extreme cold of northern Sweden and Canada. They even take it to China, a burgeoning car market where the new 911 must work even on rough roads, where the right kind of fuel can be hard to find. A total of some three million kilometers of testing. As engineers continue to test the machine, back in Germany, construction workers put the finishing touches on a brand new paint shop. Now they're ready to build the new 911. Porsche builds some very fast cars. But they don't introduce new models very often. The new 911 is only the seventh version of the automotive icon that first appears in 1963. The challenge is to make it fresh enough that everybody says, wow, look, there is the new one. And at the same time, there's no doubt that this is still a 911. It takes four years to redesign the machine. Four years fraught with peril. It's a classical, iconic shape. There's a danger that it looks too historic. 
I told my designers when we started this project, don't be afraid and make it look modern. Don't think everything is, is a holy grail. In the ultra-competitive sports car universe, a fast, sexy machine is the holy grail. The stakes for the brand are enormous. Porsche tried once to mess with the front end of a 911. It was the 911 that came out in 1999, and those cars are worth zero today. And they're great cars, but they're not really loved by enthusiasts. And one of the reasons is they tried a different front end. It had this sort of scrambled egg, melted, kind of gooey headlight. And it's amazing what happens. You do that, and people just don't immediately recognize it as a 911 and don't love it. The 911 is not Porsche's highest volume product. but it is perhaps its most important. It's gotta be a nightmare to be a Porsche engineer, right? Because you have a shape and a layout that you can't change or the purists go berserk and they just freak out. The clock continues to tick towards the car's introduction. There's a delicate balancing act taking place. Sometimes there are ideas for the new car where there's no discussion about it. We just transmit it into reality because it's absolutely clear this is the right step. Many people think the new car is much bigger than the old one, but this is not true. It's just a little bit which the car is longer. We increase the wheelbase by 100 millimeters. That's quite a lot. Another new idea is a lighter body. The biggest uh, change from its predecessor to the new car is the whole body, which gave us uh, the possibility to reduce the weight of the car, which is absolutely important for a sports car. It gives you the chance to make the car faster. Acceleration times get shorter. It improves the fuel economy, the fuel efficiency. But when Porsche engineers first start developing the new machine, there's a problem. Prototypes actually start carrying more weight. In the beginning of the development, it seems that the car is getting much heavier than its predecessor. Engineers go back to the drawing board and find inspiration from an unlikely source. Motorcycle parts make comparisons with motorcycle parts which are very light today and found out there yeah, we can reduce the weight again. Lightness is something you can't see except on a cutaway model. What you can see here, the different colors stand for different materials. All these uh, materials here are made of aluminium and you see some green parts made of steel and we use the steel materials where we need high strength. The 911 is still a pretty small car. It did get a little bit bigger and frankly that is bothering the purists because every change you make to the 911 bothers the purists. Purists who could never imagine a sports car borrowing from a bike now also see technology being cribbed from of all things an SUV. Dynamic chassis control is a complete new feature. We launched it the first time in the Cayenne. You know, Cayenne is a SUV. The dynamic chassis control system limits the amount of body roll the car experiences. Less roll means more traction. And more traction equals faster lap times. I have to be honest, when we started development, the guys from the chassis department came to me and say we should install also with the Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control in the 911. I said, why does this car need a PDCC, as we call it? Traditionalists might not like the idea of technology from an SUV, being put in a 911 
But it's hard to argue with the results. The new car is 14 seconds faster on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. And of these 14 seconds, five seconds are coming only out of this system. Some of those remaining seconds are shaved by building a lightweight body. A shape that first comes to life in the body shop. We have a completely new car in our body shop. It's a mix from steel, aluminium, all new materials, completely mixed in our body. A body that requires more than just traditional welding. When we have aluminium and steel, we have to put glue between the two materials and we can't weld the materials. They do weld some parts that are the same metal. It's all done automatically. When they can't weld, they use screws and rivets to help hold the body parts together. Jigs move doors into position. Cameras align the doors to the body. It's completely automatically welded. Now we are in the last station. We are making the body clean and ready to go to the paint shop. In the race to introduce the next 911, every station is on the clock. And it's always counting down. The bodies move to the new paint shop, the one now sitting next to the old factory. For the complete new 911, we had to invest a lot of money. The paint shop is time to go online with production of the new 911. Like the new car, the paint shop pushes technology to the limit. First of all, we decided to do a lot more automizations in the new paint shop to guarantee a better and a stabilized quality. That means a lot of robots. Robots that open and close doors and hoods. paint and even clean off the cars with a robotic version of a combination vacuum cleaner and dust brush. The way they paint the new 911s is state of the art. Even more unique is what's happening on the top floor above the paint booth level. This is where Porsche has installed an unusual air filtering device for the entire building. One of our biggest target was to save the energy consumption and there we did a lot of air recovering, air cleaning uh, technologies. Special ducts channel all the air from the building into a cleaning system. It's not just to keep the cars being painted clean, the factory itself is one of the cleanest paint plants in the automotive world. Nearly about 70% of the air which is coming in, the, the spray boosters, they are reused, cleaned and reused in our system. 
they use that air to keep temperatures inside the plant constant without burning fossil fuels. Each year, an average car paint plant produces enough dust in the air to fill an entire truck with 120,000 kilograms of dust. With these new technologies we have installed, we only produce one barrel, one about 120 kilograms a year. The first protection is a zinc phosphate protection, and then the second stage is a paint dip. And that gives the real corrosion protection to the body. Now we are in the center of our paint shop. What you see here is the base coat application. What we are here is the, the paint line, the top coat line, all our coats beginning from the primer to the base coats and the clear coats, they are water-based. The new paint shop is finally finished with the new 911. Except for just one small detail. This is a special area we put the Porsche badge on the body. Before it was only a body, now it's a real Porsche. This is a story that started before my parents were born. That story starts in 1950. Porsche opens its Zuffenhausen factory and builds its first sports car. Called the 356. In the late 50s, it was obvious that the 356 had to have a successor. The car was based on the platform of the Volkswagen Beetle and the competitors didn't sleep. So Porsche had to have a new model with a six-cylinder engine, a model which made more than 200 kilometers per hour. Several designers had different ideas for the new car. Ultimately, it would be designed by Ferry Porsche the grandson of Dr. Ferdinand Porsche, the man who designed the original Volkswagen Beetle. The 911 was first shown to the public at the 1963 Frankfurt Auto Show. It was introduced as the 901. But then they show the 901 at the Paris Auto Show. They got a nice but uh, clear letter from Peugeot claiming to have the legal rights for all names with three figures with a zero in the middle. And so Porsche had to rename the car, which is a very dangerous thing in the automobile industry. And luckily they had the great idea to exchange the zero through the one, and the result was 911. The now renamed 911 develops an almost fanatical following amongst serious sports car enthusiasts. Many things which are typical for the 911, which uh, are there from the very first moment and which will probably never change. We have the rear engine. It's a flat six engine. Fanaticism that starts with the classic rear mounted engine. We are at the beginning of the assembling line. These are the parts for the first step of production. The crankcase, the connecting rods and the pistons, for example. They had to change about 150 parts to build the new 911 engine. The basis of the engine is nearly the same. It 
it's not a revolution, that engine, it's an evolution of the old engine. And we make a lot of things much better than we did it before. They make the new engine smaller, not physically, but internally. The amount of air that the motor can displace drops from 3.6 litres to 3.4 litres. Yet the new engine makes five more horsepower than the power plant it replaces. You won't find any part on the engine you don't need. The new engine also gets better mileage. One reason is that Porsche began developing the new engine as soon as they decided to build the new car. We started three years ago with the first prototype engines. To start with the engine production during the development period is one of our secrets. The classic 911 flat six. Redesigned. Lighter, but more powerful. And built on a totally redesigned engine line. It's about um, 16 automated robots in this assembly line. It takes about four and a half hours to build a 911 engine. And in the race to get the car ready for the Frankfurt Auto Show, they count each and every second. The safety time is 2 minutes and 45 seconds. And then they turn up the heat in their testing process. This is a hot test. These are hot test cells. We have seven and we run all our engines. Hot testing is the final quality control check for the engine. The very first time it's run under its own power. We have always been a modern factory, even if the buildings are old, because you need a modern factory to produce modern cars, and it has nothing to do with the buildings. A modern factory, where robotic carts receive electronic signals when it's time to move an engine. This automatic transporting system knows the engine is finished, he lifts it automatically and takes it to the assembling line. Engines arrive at a very unusual final assembly building. It's very unusual in, in Germany that you produce on different levels. It's an entirely vertical approach to car building. Normally, very new factories make it on one floor, on one line. In this building, we produce the 911 in three floors. They build 911s on multiple floors because they have to. Because space is limited, we can't grow horizontally. We have to uh, grow vertically. The painted bodies enter the factory on the middle floor. The doors are taken off. To be sent to a special line that adds speakers and wiring. Lots of wiring. 1.5 kilometers wiring in one car. They subassemble the dashboard right next to the line. Another example of how they need to keep changing technology in the race to get the car ready for its introduction. What we are doing here is to weld the upper and the lower part of the dashboard together. We used to use screws, but now the welding does it even better. In what looks like some kind of strange robotic ballet, a mechanical jig twists and turns a roof panel. getting it into the perfect position for installation on the car.
The cars move down the line, where other robots install the front and rear windshields. Now the partially built 911 is lowered to the bottom floor, where most of the car is assembled. Each machine is picked up by orange U-hooks, making it easier to install brake and fuel lines underneath the car. They assemble the transmission to the new engine. We are here in the factory on the, uh, you see the marriage process. The marriage process is the process where the axle, the engine and the gearbox come together with the car body. A new 911 is married, but far from ready for its honeymoon. The interior needs to be finished. The steering wheel. Seats. Bumpers installed. Of all the work still needing to be done, perhaps this is one of the best jobs. Putting the name Porsche on the back of the car. The 911 heads down to the quality control department. This comes from the final trim line where everything inside got finished. Yeah, at this station, we put the petrol into the car. And of course, for the first time inside the car, we start the engine. Time to test the new car. You're standing next to the water box where we check each car if it leaks. This is the wind noise box where we simulate the noise of wind. Our worker uses an audio measuring tool to measure the noise in the window area. Now we are on a dynamometer where we basically do a complete drive. Driver speeding up the car up to 130 kilometers per hour. We only simulate curves and he's just doing it by the acceleration control. It's a lot of quality control to go through. But with the introduction of the new machine on the horizon, the company can't leave anything to chance. It's finally time to unveil the all-new 911 here at the 2011 Frankfurt Auto Show. A place where there is plenty of competition. Exotic brands like Lamborghini, Bentley and Maserati are all out to capture the hearts, minds and mighty dollars of high-end car enthusiasts. After just under 1,400 days of hard work, the clock finally hits zero. It's time to introduce the new machine, and how it's received will help determine 
the fate of the Brum. With bated breath, the Brand introduces the new machine. It's voted the most significant model at the show by Auto Week magazine. It's the biggest achievement if you make a car where people say, look what a classic, and at the same time, it's one of the most modern looking cars on the road today. A modern looking car that though German in design and build, is aimed for Porsche's most important market. Nine thousand kilometers away from Stuttgart. Southern California. Here in the desert outside of Los Angeles, two brand new 911s are being carefully offloaded. On a day to discover what the new 911 is like in the real world. The new 911 is the first automobile to be built with a seven-speed computer-controlled manual transmission. They call it the PDK, which is good, because unless you're German, its full name is almost unpronounceable. We're driving a car with a transmission that Porsche calls a PDK, or Porsche Doppelkupplungsgetriebe, which is a lovely, simple, small German word that means Porsche double clutch transmission. And this is an automatic transmission, it's a dual clutch automatic, that shifts for us. It has an automatic mode, or I can use these paddles on the steering wheel to tell it to go second, third gear, fourth gear. I just touch a button and it selects the next gear for me instantly. I mean, there's really no, you hear that? There's real no interruption in power. It'll get right to the red line and the tachometer needle can barely keep up. It's far faster and far smoother than you can shift yourself. There are definitely benefits of having the engine out in the back, and the biggest one is traction. You can always lay all the power down coming out of a corner. These cars really, really fly out of corners. To a German, art is, is kind of different than we see art in a lot of ways. It's taking a problem and solving it in some sort of engineering way that's elegant and simple and that really works is art to Germans. I guess Porsche is just very open to things that make a car work better. I mean, on the other hand, there's a lot of things that we just don't do because we say, yeah, it's technically possible, but is it really something the driver needs? The new 911, Porsche's latest example of how it views the marriage of art and technology. A car that balances history, quirks, and perhaps what some aficionados would even call love. Two teams of London breakers go head to head in Stripper's Cars for Cash, a brand new series starting tonight at 10. Stay tuned for Air Crash in